Gardeners are always chasing the holy grail of soil health humus that lasts, enriches the earth, and makes crops thrive season after season. Compost has long been praised as the answer, yet history reveals a forgotten material that pre-World War II farmers considered even more powerful. It wasn't manure, it wasn't fertilizer, and it wasn't something you could simply buy off the shelf. This humble material, when paired with the right soil, built humus more quickly and with greater staying power than compost ever could. The secret was moss peat. Compost is excellent at jump-starting fertility, but its benefits fade faster than most gardeners realize. Once added to soil, compost decomposes within one to two years. Nutrients are released quickly but the organic matter itself vanishes, leaving little behind to stabilize soil in the long term. For gardeners managing sandy soils that lose water too fast or those heavy clays that, you know, just suffocate roots, compost often feels like a short-term fix rather than a permanent improvement. This is where moss peat really stood apart. Unlike compost, it wasn't freshly broken down organic matter teeming with bacteria. Instead, it was ancient formed over centuries in bogs where mosses and plants decayed at a glacial pace in waterlogged, oxygen-poor environments. What remained wasn't a quick burst of fertility but, instead, a dense reservoir of humic substances. These are the compounds that give humus its legendary ability to bind soil, store nutrients, and regulate moisture. By itself, moss peat could appear, well, pretty unimpressive. It contained little immediate nutrition and often seemed kind of inert when sprinkled onto overworked fields. But pre-World War II farmers understood something vital. Peat was never meant to work alone. Its true power only emerged when paired with soils alive with native microbial life. When mixed into virgin soil, earth that had never been stripped by plows or chemicals, the results were honestly astonishing. Fungi and microbes colonized its fibrous structure, Worms dragged it deeper, and together they wove peat's stable carbon into living humus. What compost accomplished in a season, peat achieved in a way that endured for decades. Farmers watched pale, lifeless fields turn dark, spongy, and fertile. Crops grew sturdier, roots ran deeper and really the land itself seemed reborn. You know, long before synthetic fertilizers became common, peat was treated as a valuable soil activator. Farmers would harvest it from boglands, dry it, and store it with great care. They didn't waste it by spreading it thinly across entire fields. Instead, they applied it strategically in patches of soil near woodlands or meadows, where microbial diversity was strongest. They understood that if peat was placed where soil life thrived, it actually became a catalyst for transformation. Accounts from the 1930s describe soils enriched with peat as living earth. Unlike compost, which quickly disappeared, peat created humus that held water like a sponge and gave sand and clay some real structure. Fields treated this way produced balanced crops, neither overfed nor starved, and showed a resilience against drought and stress that, honestly, baffled neighboring farmers who relied only on manure or ash. After World War II, farming shifted dramatically. Synthetic nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium promised instant results, and farmers abandoned those slower, biology-based methods. Moss peat was reduced to just a potting medium for seedlings, and its reputation as a soil builder was, well, nearly forgotten. By the middle of the 20th century, entire generations of growers, well, they just didn't know how to use it the way their grandparents once had. This loss of knowledge really came at a cost. Industrial fertilizers, sure, they delivered yields in the short term, but over time, they stripped soils of life. The very microbial communities that once activated peat dwindled away, leaving modern soils dependent on ever-increasing chemical inputs. Large-scale harvesting of peat bogs is, honestly, no longer an option. These wetlands are precious ecosystems and, you know, stripping them damages more than it heals. But the principle behind Pete's effectiveness, well, that's something we can, and really should, revive. What made moss peat so powerful wasn't its nutrition, but its stable carbon framework. It acted as scaffolding that soil microbes and fungi could colonize. 
Nowadays we can mimic this effect with more sustainable materials like leaf mold, shredded bark, forest duff, or even biochar. You know, the lesson from history is pretty clear. Stable carbon alone is just not enough. The real secret lies in pairing it with soils that are alive, with fungi, bacteria, and worms all working together. For example, adding leaf mold to a depleted garden bed does very little on its own. But, adding it to woodland edges, compost-rich areas, or worm-active soil can really spark the same humus-building reaction that peat once offered. If you happen to have access to a small amount of peat, or maybe a sustainable substitute, go ahead and mix it into soil where life is already thriving. Just remember, never add it to sterile ground. Once soil organisms find their way into those carbon fibers, they slowly break it down, weave it into aggregates and create a humus structure that holds fertility for years instead of just months. For gardeners who enjoy precision, you can make a simple blend. Mix one part well-cured leaf mold or fine biochar with three parts active microbe-rich compost, then dilute with water at a rate of one gallon per five pounds of material until the mixture is moist but not soggy. Incorporating this blend into active soils encourages fungi and worms to colonize quickly, setting in motion the same living processes that once made peat well legendary. You know, modern gardening often views soil as just an empty vessel waiting to be filled with fertilizer, but the old peat method, it reminds us that soil is a living system. Amendments only reach their full potential when they interact with the biology already present. Compost, it's more than just food, it's an inoculation. And mulch, well, it's more than just cover, it's a habitat for fungi. Peat, in its original use, was more than just organic matter. It was like a spark that activated the hidden life of soil. Rebuilding soil in this way, it's not just about improving one season's harvest. No, it's about creating fertility that endures, resisting drought, disease, and depletion. It's about bringing back forgotten wisdom at a time when our soils need it most. You see, the story of moss peat is a reminder that gardening success is never about quick fixes. It's about patience, biology, and respect for the living systems beneath our feet. By learning from the past and applying those lessons sustainably today, we can build humus faster and more effectively than with compost alone, without harming fragile peatlands. So, if you want to grow crops in soils that stay fertile for generations, not just a season, this is the path forward. And hey, if this knowledge inspires you, why not subscribe to Soil and Crop Central? We continue to uncover forgotten methods, timeless practices, and modern insights to help you grow stronger, healthier soils that last.